Hello, welcome back. People call me Nukes, and we're going to dig into this alleged A50 IL-22M shootdown. Could it be friendly fire? Uh, TLDR? Sure, yes, but it's not really that simple. And again, before you get too far into this video, please click the link at the top um, for the previous version. It's got some good information there. So this map, this map is our magnum opus. This thing is represents all of the satellite imagery, all the tracking of the air defense assets that we've done for months. Um, I don't even know how much money this thing's worth. <laughs> so, you know, if you, if at all possible, um, it would really help us if you could upgrade to a paid membership. And for those who are, who are seeing this video early, thank you so much. It, you know, it made this possible. All right, so uh, let's just discuss what we have on the map. We have these range contours, and they represent different missiles. They're marked here, so your 5V55, your 48N6, your 48N6 Delta, and your 48N6 Delta Mike. Um, and we, we've combined the contours from the different sites that, that we know of. Um, these red lines they're s300v please know that these are mostly marketing fluff and that we don't know the actual ranges we do know that planes have been shot down at 200 kilometers so you know in here somewhere um with s300v and that, that's about it s300v is not as well known it's an anti-missile system it's totally different than s300p which is more of a anti-aircraft and has some anti-missile capability. Um, this blue line here, this is the PAC-2 contour. It's 150 kilometers from the front line. Um, the PAC-2 listed range is 160. Figured 10 kilometers setback because you can't just roll it up to the line of control. <laughs> it's a good way to lose a Patriot battery or system. Anyway, uh, let's move on. So then we've got this front line here. That is the actual line of control um, right through there. And that was from uh, UA control map, the project owl map. All right, what else do we have here? So um, let's start off with S300 and 400. Um, we know a big list of, uh, of the sites that we know about, and they're all on the map here. The relevant ones. There's certainly more up to the north here around, um, you know, the, the outskirts of Russia proper, not the occupied parts of Ukraine. But those are irrelevant for this. Um, the blue circle here is the shoot down area, and that is the area from the radar image that uh, was released that shows. You know, the area the plane went down, presumably shot down in the same area. Um, okay, so let's get into this a little bit. We left um, Yev Pretoria off of here, Yev Pateria, because it, it's right in here. Um, the reason we left it off is because it's been missing in action lately. Um, after the strikes a couple of months ago, they've been moving it around, and we don't quite know where it's at or if it, they've removed it or what. And as you can see, they've got pretty good coverage there already. Um, however, these are max range um, contours. And for something lower in altitude, the radar is not going to be able to see it at max range. But for this IL-22 uh, IL A-50 incident, you know, they were up high. So we can use these ranges fairly confidently um, from most of the sites. All right, so Let's start off with S300, um, and this is the S400, the P version, the uh, the well-known versions. Um, so, was it likely that S300 shot down the IL-22 and the the A50? I'm going to say that it it's not it's non-zero. You know, we're looking at 10% odds if you look at my graph at the bottom. And the reason I think that it's a fairly low amount you know low odds is one thing the plane looks like it came out of tangerog and then went this way 
and then it kind of showed up on station and it started to move around and it was intercepted somewhere right down in here as it kind of spun circles down to the ground. Um, that whole way it would be tracked by these S-400 sites. They'd see it from takeoff. Um, presumably all of these uh, um, S-400 sites are in a conference uh, battle net, you know, where they can talk. And also the A-50 is part of the S-400 air defense system. You know, it, they're talking about using it for what's called cooperative engagement capability or, you know, co cooperative engagement uh, some kind of protocol that they're using to where the plane can actually guide the 48 and 60 m missiles. Um, if that's the case, then there has to be data-like communications between the IL uh, or the A-50 and the ground, and it has to be networked into the, the system. There may be some kind of, uh, you know, it has to get on station before it hands off. It may have flown low until it got, you know, down into this area somewhere just because of the proximity to the front line here. So it wanted to stay below the radio horizon, the radar horizon coming from the front line, and it came up into that area. But I still don't quite get how the A-50 would have, I mean, it's not impossible, but the fact that they're all probably communicating in the same battle net, uh, the people in the A-50, the people in the IL-22, and the people in the um, various S-400 garrisons and sites around here, you know, they, they're going to communicate. They have to coordinate their actions, especially if they're going to illuminate a target and try to fire a missile at it. So that's, that's part of the reason I just don't, don't understand how that could happen. It doesn't mean it didn't, it just doesn't seem that likely. Um, then let's move on to S-300V. So S-300V is a totally different system. S-300V is mainly an anti-missile system. It uses different missiles. It's tracked and highly mobile, and mounted on tank-like vehicle vehicles. Um, and it moves around kind of protecting the ground troops. It, it provides, you know, high-level coverage of the battlefield, um, specifically to take out missiles. That was what it was designed for. It was designed to take out uh, incoming missiles during the Cold War, things like ALCMs and uh, SRAM and all of those things that we had back then, even Pershing too. So that, those are kind of what it was designed for. It does have an air breathing capability, except for we don't know the ranges, as mentioned before. They are crazy. Like this 400 kilometer range is going to be very difficult. One, because it can't see 400 kilometers from the ground unless what it's shooting is like way high up like an incoming missile like ballistic missile um beyond that the missile ranges are just not as well known because they don't have as many of these they don't use them as often and the public data is just not out there um, the reason we put s300v on here is because we see it kind of operate into this area here um around Luhansk and it's highly mobile they move it around and they sort of they cover the uh, the largest part of uh, you know their big stronghold there in, in Luhansk with uh, anti-missile capability and they cover their big training area there which is just down in here somewhere so it's there I think it's very unlikely that it was S-300V that would be something else I just it doesn't seem like the target set, and it's way out on the edge of the range. It just doesn't seem likely to me. 5% or less. Um, let's move on. All right, let's discuss the other systems. Um, we're still on the map, the Pac-2 range, but let's discuss the other, you know, friendly fire incidents. So, Book. So, Book could... The problem with Book, and the reason I don't have any contours on the map, so Book could literally just, it could be anywhere here. It could be all around the outside of the Azov. It, it, it could just be anywhere. It has a 70 kilometer range, which is, you know, quite a ways. This, this here is 80 kilometers right here uh, for the M3 variant. It's less for the other variants, but if you take that, that same line and draw it out here, 
you can see that the M3 would basically, if put in the right place, could cover the entire Azov. Um, Book seems a little more likely to me. And the reason is Book is, is vertical command structure goes through the ground forces versus the air defense forces. So they may not have been communicating with the A-50 at the time. And if they weren't communicating and Russia has this uh, well-known lack of IFF, which is identified um, friend or foe, it's basically, uh, you know, you call it a transponder for the most of the time, but they have different systems than the IKO systems that we're used to and the Western military systems. Um, they're just notoriously bad at IFF. That's basically it. Um, we've seen other planes get shot down and especially from differing units, the communications isn't very good. So Book makes the most sense. Um, I would give Book a 30%. We also saw, you know, the MH17 incident in what 2014, they shot down the big uh, commercial aircraft. It was a triple seven, I believe, with Book, and that was, uh, you know, lack of coordination. The other thing that can happen with Book is you can use the teller, the the transporter director of launcher and radar. So with uh, most of the M2 and M M1, M2, and some of the M3 variants, the radar is built into the TEL, the transporter vector launcher and radar. And that can actually engage targets on its own. But the IFF capabilities weak without the 9S18 snowdrift um, radar. So, you know, that's a big problem with using the um, engagement radar only instead of being linked up to early warning radars and we haven't seen very many um, I haven't seen any snowdrift radars the 9s18 radars for the book system they could be sending other data through data links or something to those book systems but I don't know satcom's pretty unreliable um, for Russia and you know books highly mobile so that begs the question how does that data link work um, they could do cellular i don't know what their ip capability is they could do you know robust military data link back to some kind of hq but then they would need towers they would have to operate within a, a ring so those book asset those book um assets may be out there kind of on their own but communicating with the il-22 and that's the other question since the il-22 and the a50 were just launching is book does the boot command post data link to IL-22 or um, providing airborne relay for the air defense system as well? Because that is possible. We just don't know how they're operating the system right now. And we're probably not going to know for some time. So again, let's leave book where it's at. We're going to give it a 30% chance. Um, okay, so let's talk about an F-16. First off, yeah, they're not really flying. They're still training on them. We have no evidence that this was F-16. Um, I find it very unlikely this was F-16. Um, part of the reason is I think that Ukraine would have just used it as a PR coup. They would have just leaned fully into, hey, our new F-16s are taking out this high value asset. asset. Um, the other thing is we don't know how, if they've got like the Charlie 7 120s, AIM-120 missiles, the AMRAMs that can go 120 kilometers. We don't know which version they have for sure. At least I don't. Um, and I haven't looked into it because I just don't think it's F-16. I don't feel like it's F-16. It just too early for that. We haven't even seen the F-16s in action yet. Um, could it be? Yes. Is it? I think it's highly unlikely. F-16 gets 1% in my book. We're going to move on from that. All right, let's talk about PAC-2. I'm giving PAC-2 like 54%, which is everything that's left. And the reason is, is one, it's in range. Here's the shoot down area. Yes, you'd have to move it pretty close to the line, you know, somewhere in here, um, somewhere in here, you know, somewhere in those areas. Is that possible? Sure. Could they have tracked this with another radar, like the 80K6 um, 
radars we saw, where were they? They were in here. We saw one up here, I believe. And, and they were, two of them were damaged um, or destroyed by Russia. Well, an 80K6, I'm sorry, and an ST-68U were destroyed. And we've seen other ST-68Us destroyed. So I know there have been a lot of speculation out there that the S-300 radars were used. There was a little tidbit on Telegram about it. Um, I don't know what they mean specifically by S-300 radar. Does that mean a 92N6 or a, um, sorry, that's not what they have, the 30N6, the older version? or the even older version than that of the X-band in, um, engagement radar that is uh, part of the S-300 system that actually guides the missiles. I mean, yes, that radar could provide a good, good target quality of data. I find it more likely that they were using something like a TRML-4D or an 80K-6, big phased array radar, or even the ST-68U. And the reason that is, is that those radars can provide very accurate target data, but they can also do it while they're um, not locked onto the target. They essentially track while scan. Um, they can give you really good information to where the um, aircraft is operating, and they can sit there and operate in early warning mode, and they won't know about it on the uh, at the A50 or the IL-22, which you have to assume has. Um, ELINT assets, radar warning receivers, you know, SIGINT, ELINT receivers, and it's picking the stuff up and trying to locate some of these assets, or at least watching for them, you know, that they got a lock. So the next thing that can happen, that data could be shared with Patriot. Now, it could be shared in a very simple manner. I mean, they, they could have done the math and the, you know, everything needed to say, hey, we're going to point this radar at so many degrees at this elevation, which is where the plane is. And when the plane has been, you know, kind of spinning around orbiting, when it gets there, you're going to turn the, the MPQ-65 on and lock the target and go. Um, I believe Patriot can fire and track wall scan as well, so they don't know until the PAC-2 uh, turns on its own radar and acquires the target, which is going to be basically too late at that point for something that can't maneuver. I mean, an IL-22 and a A-50 aren't going to be able to pull, you know, multiple Gs and go evasive like a fighter jet. So that said, I, I think it was Patriot, but we don't know and we don't have that evidence. I suspect it was a long shot there, and I suspect that they fired two missiles. And they, they got lucky. Um, the missiles were like 10 minutes apart. And it sounds to me like uh, they just got lucky, did a good job. We don't know how many missiles they fired. I'm assuming maybe just two. And the reason for that is this was a long shot, kind of a Hail Mary sort of pass. And they don't have that many. Um, so that, that's what I think. Of course, these were high value targets. There could have been four missiles, you know, to guarantee a hit or, or at least up the odds. Uh, this is a long range. This is a tricky shot. It's tough. But the other thing is, is that 160 kilometers is open source. There's a good chance that Pac-2 can go slightly further or further. And, you know, it, it's missile kinematics. So depending on the wind direction, depending on a lot of atmospheric things, the range changes somewhat. Um, it, coming up with the range of a missile is kind of difficult. You don't know how it's going to fly. You don't know its flight profile. This should have been more or less a, uh, a big ballistic arc down onto the target um, at that kind of range. That's pretty much the only way to get it out that far, just with physics. Um, again, it missiles are... Our aircraft essentially they, they have lift and drag and they have all kinds of you know friction wind direction atmospheric density wind uh, speed wind shear all of those things can affect the range of a missile um, and if Ukraine knows 
waiting for the right conditions, they, they can get a pretty good shot out of it. They can up their uh, PK by knowing, which is the probability of kill, knowing the weather conditions and the, the atmospheric conditions. Um, some other things that could play into this would be uh, shaping the battlefield. I'm not a military expert, never served in the military, so disclaimer, but um, the strikes in Crimea, I believe that those strikes made the A-50 operate more. I don't know that it pulled it in that much further unless they're trying to look at, say, Odessa, um, which would make sense. So let's say you take this one out, which, which Mayak radar site and that uh, S-400 site were attacked several times up there, Olanivka and Mayak. Um, if you've taken out communications or you've taken out the ability to launch, um, or the radar, you know, any of that. In order to see Odessa, the plane is going to have to uh, move over into this area a little bit further. But that's not what we saw on the uh, on Zaluzhny's uh, release of the radar data. When you saw it come straight out of Tangarog, wiggle around and kind of spiral in right here. So I don't know. Um, if they did shape the battlefield, I think it was much more likely that um, they made it op the A-50 operate more. They upped its op tempo by taking other systems out. Um, that's my thought. And the, one of the main reasons is we've seen it operate in that area on satellite imagery in the shoot down area right in here since October the 2nd, I haven't gone back any further than that, but I know at least since October the 2nd of 23, it's been operating there, which was well before the shoot down. Um, it wasn't necessarily before all of these attacks along the coast here. Um, the Kerch radar site as well. But again, uh, it just doesn't look like they were willing to bring the A-50 like way up over here and risk um, getting it shot down. They were playing it safe and staying back in this other red circle that I drew. So all of that said, I think it was PAC-2, and I'm going to stick with that until evidence changes my mind. And to be honest, the main reason is, one, it's in range. Two, that's what the Ukrainians said it was. And they got a pretty good track record of not making claims for things they didn't do. They couple have happened, don't get me wrong, but for the most part, especially on these big shoot-down incidents or big high-value target things like Moskova, um, the submarine and the dry dock, those things, I mean, yeah, we had video of them and pictures come out pretty quick, and we really haven't had that here, except for the IL-22's tail, not conclusive to which missile it was, but again, Ukraine's been pretty upfront about these high value targets. So that's the reason I'm leaning towards that. Yes, it's pure speculation. We don't have the evidence yet, so please use this with caution. I don't want everybody going around the internet saying, Nuke said this, Nuke said it was this. It has to be this. No, it, I could be wrong. I'm probably wrong. This is a guess. So uh, I put that out there because people enjoy the discussion. Um, this is open source intelligence. There is a need for telling a story and speculating when it comes to intelligence operations, and that is to get your brain working and thinking about the problem. That's how I work my way through these problems. I try to put myself in the position of, you know, the A-50 operator or the commander in charge of the overall picture. Why, why would they send the A-50 up? I also try to put myself in the Ukrainian side and think about why. So speculation, I know some people are totally against it. It's not bad as long as it's treated as such. I am not making any sort of firm claims here. So please use this with caution. Um, Panzer and Tor, I think I forgot that. I just don't. Panzer and Tor is really unlikely. I mean, they would have to be even at the 40 kilometer range. I mean, yes, it could go here or even from here, but it just strikes me as odd that you, first of all, 
would be watching an asset take off out at Tangerog because their their radar range is going to be decent. It's going to be you know something like that, maybe a little more, um, if they're looking out that way. They they would see the plane coming. They it has been operating in that area for a long time, and traditionally those short range assets aren't going to be taking out high flying aircraft flying in racetracks. That's just not what they're for. You know, Panzer's really there to take out, to do point defense for cruise missiles and drones and even Gimlers they try to shoot, and they have got a couple. Um, same for Tor. Tor's very similar. Um, Tor was more of a, I'm going to follow the ground forces around, an armored asset. Panzer's more highly mobile to protect high-value targets, and there are quite a few of them, and they're somewhat effective. But... This is not their traditional deal. You know, they're there to protect the general or the communication center or the ammo dump from incoming munitions. Aircraft as well, strike aircraft, but not an A-50 way up high. That's just not really their role. Yes, it could do it, so I can't say it's zero, but I'm going to give that a very low chance. You know, we're, we're talking a few percent here. So anyway... That's it. I'm done. I wanted to mention Panzer and Tor real quick because I kind of skipped over them because they really just aren't relevant in this case, in my opinion. I included some uh, line of sight plots for the radars to show that uh, these radars uh, had uh, coverage of the area. Um, just, you know, you gotta, can't shoot what you can't see. So that all checks out. Um, just a quick conclusion here. I think most likely pack two. It's still probable, less likely, you know, we're talking 30% chance. Um, or well, probable, but there's still a 30% chance that uh, this was friendly fire, in my opinion. I mean, a little more than that. You actually got, what, 45% chance when you add them all up. So we're right there. We're, we're, we're still batting 50-50, more or less, on this. Just a little bit more towards pack 2. I think the F-16s, I put them on there just to show everybody that I don't think it was that. Uh, 1%. I can't rule it out. That's the only reason I've got it on here. Um, I didn't include space aliens or, uh, you know, somebody sabotaging the aircraft or anything like that because, you know, one, we saw frag damage to the IL-22, which means it was most likely an air defense missile. So, I mean, it could be space aliens, yes. I don't think it was some mystery NATO, you know, space secret spook strike thing no i think this was ukraine doing what ukraine does best and taking out russians i think russia was pretty smart with the way they had been operating this but they didn't realize that they were being targeted for months i think this was a long planned operation and i think the a50 was providing a pretty good capability and i think it needed to go from the Ukrainian side. And beyond that, it was a big PR um, gain. It was a great for their PR. It was a, at a time of low morale. It Everybody got excited. It was just good timing. Um, whether that was planned or not, I don't know. But uh, we need to stop this. We're 28 minutes in. Thank you for watching. Um, as always, thank you for subscribing. If you're a paid subscriber, you've made this possible. This was a very expensive map. I know it doesn't look like it, but it was very expensive to source the data for this map. Uh, multiple thousands of dollars. So if you'd like to uh, join as a paid subscriber, it would help. And if you've noticed the sad imagery slow down a little bit, that's because the money's tight right now. Um, and I've also been kind of busy, but we're going to pick things back up here and get some more sad imagery and look at some stuff. But, uh, yeah, that's all I got today. Please consider some su subscribing 
And uh, if you want to donate and don't want to subscribe, there's also Buy Me a Coffee. So check that out. Anyway, catch you later. Um, just speculation for the most part here. Use caution. We'll talk to you next time. Thanks. Bye.